Hi there, how are you going? Andrew Dunkley here. Great to have your company again on another edition of Space Nuts. Coming up on this episode, we're going to be looking at, well, Mars. Gosh, when was the last time we did that? About a week ago. Uh, but a uh, good reason for it, because they've uh, made a discovery that uh, is mind-blowing. Uh, lots of things on Mars are bigger than they are on Earth, even though it's a much smaller planet. This is one of those. We're also talking archaeology. Now, where um, when you talk archaeology, you're thinking of um, people digging around in the dirt looking at bones. No, they're looking at dirty socks on the ISS, amongst other things. Um, or maybe not specifically socks, but the International Space Station, yes. And the link between science fiction and real science, uh, there's a uh, fascinating story that talks about that as well, all coming up on this edition of Space Nuts. 15 seconds, guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space Nuts. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And here to discuss it all and talk about the shopping list from last week is Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large. Hello, Fred. Well, there's bacon, there's cornflakes, there's soap, all on the shopping list from last week. So mm. plenty to talk it's, about. It's all processed food, even the soap. Yes, even the soap. Yeah. Apparently, <laughs> that's so, no, Pardon? Do you eat soap oh, as I, well? Yeah. Oh, I did when I was a kid. I was a pretty <laughs> stupid kid, though. But uh, apparently it's very good for catching mice, is soap, I'm told. Well, there you go. That's interesting. Mm. Yes. I don't know how true it is, but uh, I've what never you tried do? it. Throw, throw, throw it at the mice or...? You put it on the on the mousetrap. And then, oh, okay. Yeah. Maybe it's the smell that gets them in and bang. You yeah, got well, it. that's right. It could be, yes. I don't don't know for certain. Um, shall we just get started because we've got a lot to get through? <laughs> yes, we should. <laughs> okay, let's, let's do that. that. Uh, our first story today involves uh, the red planet Mars. And as I mentioned at the very beginning, it's a, it's a place with uh, some of the biggest things in the solar system, the, the, the biggest mountains, the deepest canyons, and now it looks like the largest lake. It's, uh, it's, a, it's an Really fascinating place for all of those reasons and more, Fred. Uh, yes, it is. Um, and it, in some ways, this is uh, a bit surprising um, because we know that probably most of Mars's northern hemisphere in ancient times, and by that I mean three to four billion years ago, probably had uh, world water on it. It probably had an ocean uh, that uh, basically covered it. Uh, we don't know whether that ocean lasted a long time, whether it was something temporary or whether it sat there for hundreds of millions of years, but it definitely had its effect on the landscape. But this story is from, actually, it's kind of the equatorial region of Mars. Um, in fact, it's it's actually um, in the southern hemisphere that we're, that we're talking about. So not that far south of the equator, I think from about minus 20 uh, five degrees. Uh, um, what we have there is a much uh, more highland region of Mars. That's where a lot of craters are, where there are a lot of mountains. Uh, and uh, it's a region that you wouldn't expect to be home to large bodies of water. But images mm. from the European Space Agency's Mars Express, which has been photographing Mars from above I don't know, probably about the last, the best part of certainly more than 10 years, but probably more like 15 years. Uh, Mars Express uh, has not only photographed the surface of Mars, uh, but also as it has orbited the planet, it's got ground uh, surface radar, uh, so you get very accurate topographical maps. And it's by studying those maps that um, scientists based at uh, a number of institutions in Europe um, have what they've done is they've looked very carefully at the top topography of a region um, which is quite a large region of Mars that encompasses several uh, regions, the Ariadnes, Coles, the Gorgonum Chaos, the Newton Crater, uh, Caralis Chaos, all of these are zones on Mars. <clears throat> Turns out, though, that you can lump them all together uh, and you can draw a contour around them. 
And you can oh, also, wow. from that, work out that that was once a shoreline. Uh, and um, from that, you can establish that, uh, and it's not just the appearance of this, I think the chemistry actually also uh, bears, backs this up, uh, but you can work out that there was a very large lake there, uh, which has a name. Uh, it is called Lake Eridania. Uh, and Lake Eridania, as I said, three times bigger than the biggest uh, lake on Earth, which is the Caspian Sea. Uh, so it's a colossal body of water, or it would have been when it was wet. It's not wet now, but the evidence is all there. And um, there's so much geological support for this idea that to some extent it's surprising that we haven't been talking about it before. Uh, mm. But uh, yes, much is being learned uh, about this region of Mars. And it may, will, may, may be that it also involved geothermal activity. Um, you know, when, when, uh, uh, when that water was there, there may well have been geothermal vents on the, on the floor of that lake, uh, which have given rise to some of the interesting chemistry of the minerals that, that, w that we find on, on that region. So, yeah, really interesting story from a planet that yeah, is the planet that keeps on giving, really, isn't it? Mars. Yeah. <laughs> so so three times bigger than the Caspian Sea, which is the biggest inland body of water on Earth. Yes. And it measures 371,000 square kilometres. So we're That's talking, cool. what, 1 to 1 1.2 million square kilometres of water? Something of that sort. That's correct. Uh, you know, about 1.1 million square kilometres is the estimate from the scientists who've done this work. Uh, it's, um, you know, it, it is... Uh, it, 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 when you think of a of a body of water like that, you think in terms of oceans. Uh, it's not an ocean. It's basically bounded by land, uh, unlike the ocean in the northern hemisphere, which uh, certainly was bounded on its southern border, but uh, but probably covered the polar region as well. So it is um, yes, it's it's what you could perhaps call an inland sea or a lake, but whatever it was, it's a lot of water, uh, and um, uh, right, really quite extraordinary evidence uh, for its existence too. The, the paper that um, we've been looking at, and there's a very nice summary of it on the University Today uh, website uh, that shows some of the evidence uh, as to why we now believe that this lake existed. Yeah, um, it, 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 it shows that, um, or it, it confirms, I suppose, previous theories about the abundance of water on Mars. Do we have any idea what kind of water it might have been? Has that sort of been... Um, it was probably wet. Uh, <laughs> was it be... salty? <laughs> um, look, it might, <laughs> it might have had, uh, because of the fact that we, you know, the, the, the scientists have really looked very closely at the minerals uh, that have been deposited on the floor of this extinct lake, um, in particular chlorides around the, around the shoreline, um, and which may be related to the, deep, um, you know, volcanic activity. Uh, the suggestion is that it would have been quite rich in minerals. So yes, salty is probably a good way, a good way to describe it. Um, uh, it's um, there's, there's some very interesting chemistry that's, uh, that I think is being studied in relation to this. So very fine piece of work. Mm. Did, could it have existed long enough for some kind of microbial life to exist? A uh, sixty-four thousand dollar question there. Um, yeah, it is. <laughs> maybe it could. Uh, you know, maybe um, uh, you, you could find evidence of life there. Uh, and, and I suppose the reasoning will be very similar to why Perseverance is in Jezero Crater at the moment, because that's a place where there was a where definitely was a river delta, a river delta, uh, which is thought to have deposited material brought down from a long river system, uh, quite a long way actually from the region we're talking about at the moment. But but um, it, it's a place where you expect the sediments to have been dropped to the to the floor of the crater in the case of Jezero Crater, and they might carry evidence of microbial life, as we talked about not very long ago. And it's possible mm. that this lake, uh, Lake Eridania, might also have the same sort of properties that maybe um, the the sediments on its on its bed, um, which in some cases were you know almost a kilometre below the surface. It's a deep lake. It's not uh, not just a, a shallow stretch of of land. Uh, so that there may be evidence to be gained uh, if uh, somebody felt like sending a spacecraft there to have a look. 
Oh, yeah. Yeah, it sounds like it's a prime target for future investigation. So, yes. Yeah. Uh, and the volcanic activity that went along with it may well have, um, you know, we talk about volcanic activity in the depths of our ocean where life is abundant. So, you know, could that kind of scenario have existed in this particular lake on Mars? Who knows? Uh, we're talking about a time frame of three to four billion years when this yeah. lake existed, but it took a long time to, to disappear from what I can tell. I think that's right. And, you know, that's uh, one of the one of the areas of interest in, uh, in terms of research on Mars. How long uh, did it take for Mars to become a dry, a cold and dry world rather than a warm and wet world? In fact, it's, it's a question we've had from uh, Space Knots listeners as well. How long did that process take? And it probably mm. took quite a long time. And it may have occurred in episodes, Andrew, where you've got a wet period and then a dry period and then a wet period, and the dry period just gets that bit longer than the last one was, and uh, bef before you know where you are, you've, you've dried up the whole thing. Uh, and it, it, it we'll never really be able to play a movie of that, but I'm sure the evidence will build up as to what kind of duration these, uh, these water systems had. Yes, indeed. Uh, imagine if humanity had time to evolve on Mars and then came to the realisation that their planet was dying. That would be a horrible thing to discover. Uh, it sounds because... like a science fiction story, does that? The start of does, a science does a fiction bit. story, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's called three-body problem. <laughs> yes, actually. that's right. Yes. That's what it's about. But, it, yeah, I mean, imagine if we right now made that discovery. We are not yet... Technology, uh, technologically capable of of doing anything about it in the in the short term, and we certainly aren't in a position to say, "All right, let's leave because this place is, you know, mm. not going to be worth hanging around." Well, there's some. There's already one person who thinks like that. <laughs> yes, there uh, is. <laughs> um, but uh, no, the, the odds are that you, you know, you'd, you'd have a very long lead time for that kind of thing, and mm. just hope your technology catches up, which it probably would. Yes, yes, indeed. All right. Uh, as Fred said, if you would like to uh, read up on that story, a uh, great article on universetoday.com. This is Space Nuts, Andrew Dunkley with Professor Fred Watson. Zero G and I feel fine. Space Nuts. Now, Fred, to our next story, and that is archaeology. Now, uh, archaeology is... Uh, the study of historical artefacts to learn about uh, the people and places of uh, of the past. That's a pretty loose uh, definition. There's all sorts of variations in what archaeology is and what it's trying to achieve. But we, we generally think about people you know, with their little brushes and spades digging yes. around the dirt, looking for triceratops skulls and um, digging around the ruins of Pompeii, for example. But this is archaeology with a difference. Uh, this is photographic archaeology, courtesy of the International Space Station and its onboard crews as they changed and um, did their work over the last two and a half decades. And they're coming up with some interesting stuff. They are indeed. Actually, um, uh, one of the authors of this uh, work is uh, an Australian uh, colleague, actually, uh, somebody I know not not terribly well, but I do know her. Her name is Alice Gorman. She's very well known as a space ar archaeologist here in Australia. She's at uh, at Flinders University. Uh, so um, that is, uh, you know, the preface to what I think is a really interesting piece of work. Uh, and you know what what has happened is that um, they uh, Alice and her colleagues have applied standard archaeological methods to a very non-standard environment, yeah. uh, namely the space station. They've, uh, they've basically divided the space station up into one metre squares, all the surface area, and that's what you do in archaeology. You divide your archaeological site into a grid of one metre squares, and then you take... Uh, excavations of some of those squares, which are known as test pits. Uh, and so you dig your pit, uh, one metre square, and that gives you a sample of what kind of stuff there is in there. And so um, the uh, scientists who've 
done this work have obviously uh, collaborated very strongly with the, the crew of the International Space Station, uh, which itself is a movable feast because um, in the 23 years or 24 years that it's been inhabited, um, something like 280 people have visited it. <laughs> so Yeah, that uh, blows my mind. I would never have put it at that many. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's a lot. Uh, so that... Um, large number, you know, uh, some of the, the recent inhabitants have been not co-opted, but have been uh, collaborating with the archaeologists to to do um, what uh, archaeologists do. And what they've done is laid out five, what, what they call sample areas, uh, which are roughly a metre square uh, to, to follow standard archaeological practice. Um, and um, I, there's a very nice conversation article about this. So I'm going to read from uh, that because I um, I think it's probably better than I could put it. We chose the square locations to encompass zones of work, science, exercise and leisure. Uh, the crew also selected a sixth area based on their own idea of what might be interesting to observe. Um, and there's a, actually a nice uh, acknowledgement there. The study was, was uh, sponsored by the International Space Station National Laboratory. Uh, and what, what they've done is they've, uh, they've given the, um, the space archaeology uh, exercise a name. Uh, it is an acronym. In the acronym I love it. I love this. <laughs> it's a good one, isn't it? It's a good, yeah. good one. It's the Sampling Quadrangle Assemblages Research Experiment or Square. <laughs> that's very clever be there or be square that's right mm. so they're square um and yeah what they found is really interesting um, um some of the areas that they've sampled are very busy areas you know on the way from one part of the space station space station to another um they, they, they there's a rather nice um a rather nice uh summary here um in the conversation article the space station is cluttered and chaotic, cramped and dirty. There I knew no the dirty bit. Yeah. There are no boundaries between where the crew works and where they rest. There is little or no privacy. There isn't even a shower. Um, so, uh, you know, that sentence actually reminds me of um, of the uh, Vogon Destructor Fleet. Because that That's was right. all full of old mattresses. Mattresses. It? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably like that. Yeah. And, anyway. Um, uh, so they've analysed uh, the, the conversation article uh, that the, these authors have written, uh, analyses the, the first two squares. And one, uh, I'm reading again, one was located in the US Node 2 module where there are four crew berths and connections to the European and Japanese labs. Visiting spacecraft often dock here. Our target was a wall where the maintenance work area is located. There's a blue metal panel with 40 Velcro squares on it and a table before for fixing equipment or doing experiments. Um, and NASA intended the area to be used for maintenance. However, we saw hardly any evidence of maintenance there and only a handful of science activities. In fact, for 50 of the days covered by our survey, the square was only used for storing items which may not even have been used there. So it's because the amount of Velcro there, uh, you know, that made it, just made it perfect for storing things. Yeah. Uh, it says close to half all the items recorded, 44%, were related to holding other items in place. So That's amazing. Go. Yeah. Yeah. I, I suppose one of the things they've discovered from all of this is that if they're going to build space stations in the future, and they probably will, they need to consider... Things like storage. I mean, even when we yep. were selling our last house, one of the feedback things was, where's all the storage? We need storage. Yes. Want more storage. Yep. Well, it sounds like it's exactly the same for the ISS, and it's only being discovered through the people who've lived and worked there for the last 20-plus years. And you're seeing things that were built with certain intent not being used for that purpose at yes. all. Yes, that's <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, uh, yeah, they might have to um, sort of redo the blueprints on future space stations to to deal with the needs of those who are living and working there. Uh, and another example was, um, I think it was like a vanity case that someone had. Yes, that's that, right. That, that, that spent 60 days 
stuck to a wall near the near the bathroom or whatever yeah, the toilet. Toilet. near the toilet that's right they never found out who owned it <laughs> no no <laughs> but it was just there <laughs> so that, that that's the second area that they analyzed um it was uh, perhaps a more interesting area it was the, uh, sort of where the exercise machines were and the toilet uh, and it's a passageway uh, to the cupola window which is one of the best places probably on the space station um so again there was a wall with no particular function but it got everything stored on it uh including this anonymous uh, toilet bag that we uh, we just mentioned so yeah. really very interesting to to find that and i think you're right it, you know you highlighted the right thing it's all about storage uh, where mm. you can put things um it also shows how humans take advantage of the opportunities of the space yeah. they have to deal yeah. with whatever needs they have. So, uh, you know, and, and I think it changes from person to person. Um, and, and with 280 plus people going up there yeah. And, yeah. and more to come, because I think the, 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 they're not going to bring the um, ISS down for another few years yet, but it, it, it's, it's a case of, all right, I'm new, um, I yes. need to find space for my stuff, yeah. and yeah. You, yeah. you 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 adapt, yeah. and that's yeah. what's being revealed in in this uh, archaeological study, which is being done. Well, I think you say it through photographs. Yes, people on board it. taking it's photographs of these these particular yeah. Yeah. one meter square spaces to see how they evolve and change, and um, yeah, it is fascinating stuff, and and. A one-off opportunity, really, because when that space station's over and done with, all that information will be gone. That's correct, absolutely. Um, um, but you, you know, your your reasoning's right on the money, Andrew. That um, the given things like the the Gateway uh, space station, which is planned to be in orbit around the Moon, a sort of, a sort of gateway uh, resource for people to dock with before they take the journey down to the Moon's surface. Um, all of this archaeology is going to feed directly into all the sort of amenities that need to be included in, in the gateway station. <laughs> and the answer is probably going to be exactly what you've said. Storage, storage, storage. Yeah. Uh, that's what yeah. We need. Yeah. 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 And when you haven't got much room, I suppose you do have to take advantage of whatever opportunity is available. And if someone's built a wall with stacks of Velcro on it. Yeah. Well, that's right. <laughs> It's going to be, it's going to be a very tantalising opportunity to to put your stuff rather than use it for what it was built for, which I think in this case was supposed to be maintenance. Yes, that's right. So, yeah, very very yeah, interesting, interesting indeed, and uh, it is a good article. I, I actually read the whole thing start to finish and absorbed it all on the conversation website. You're listening to Space Nuts, Andrew Dunkley with Professor Fred Watson. Space nuts. Uh, now to uh, a, a genre that I am much invested in, and that's science fiction. Uh, but uh, this is a story about science fiction and science fact, and how they have uh, sort of collaborated and, and dovetailed so beautifully together. This is a really great story, Fred. It is, and it's. Um, I'm going to let you talk to this one because it's very much uh, up your, you know, up your street. But um, basically, it's uh, uh, a, a researcher is actually the director of research at Laboratoire d'Astrophysique de Marseille, down there in the south of France. Uh, uh, is a gentleman by the name of uh, Samuel Boissier. Uh, so he's done this work investigating you know, the relationship between science and science fiction, it's especially um, in against the backdrop of the era that we live in now, where, where you've got misinformation, you've got deep fakes, you've got, uh, you know, basically basically attempts to uh, to distort science uh, all of that sort of thing uh, um, you know the good old conspiracy theories all of that is distorting our view of of what science is all about um, and so it's a, an interesting context in which to put this study of the mm. relationship between science fiction and science fact yeah I think there were two keystone uh things that came out of it. And that, and that is that science fiction has a place uh, in that it, it can inspire people to look into careers in science. Uh, even though science fiction is what it is, it's, it's you know, the, the imaginations of, of writers and, and filmmakers for that matter 
um, coming out in, uh, in paper or on an ebook or on a TV or a, a big screen. Uh, but it, it does have a place in the scientific community because it has has been successful in inspiring people to get into those fields of um, of uh, education or no, those fields of expertise is what I'm trying to say. The other keystone to come out of this is that science fiction can also educate. Even though the stories are yeah. coming from some incredible minds, they have been built on the back of real science and so they they educate. Kim Stanley Robinson's Mars series is a very good highlight in terms of uh, of teaching people about not what not just what Mars is like, but what it could be if we yeah. develop technology to turn it into a livable planet, uh, which is what the Mars series was all about. Uh, the movie Interstellar is um, w- was created using real science. They used uh, and some of it was pretty well stretched. Yes, it but, was. <laughs> um, and 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 the uh, the Martian was a science fiction film, but it was so close to being really possible uh, because of the consultations they did with scientists and and, uh, astronomers, um, it it looked feasible in many respects. Uh, So there's a lot that works in and around science fiction and science um, coming together. And I think this is a really great story. And when you look at some of the early science fiction writers, they didn't have the science to back up their imaginations. <laughs> they had to think outside the box. And even some of the really early ones that that predated the rocket era came yeah. up with rocket ships yeah. as they are today. I Almost, mean, yes, that's right. Yeah, they, so the, their brains worked in incredible ways. And as someone who's written science fiction, I never, you know, I, I just let my imagination run wild, but I'm I'm not in the calibre of the um, Isaac Asimovs and Arthur C. Clarks of the, of the world who are some of the greatest of all time and have written some of the classic sci-fi stories. Um, but I've tried to work it into what could be conceived as feasible if if it ever came to be, which it probably won't, but that's the nature of science fiction. Um, but some of the some of the homework that goes into these stories is based on real science, and some of the people who are working in science today have been inspired by stories from the imaginations of great people. And that's what this is this is all about. And I think it's fantastic stuff. I really am um, I'm delighted by this story, to yeah. be honest. <laughs> and, I mean, going back to um, that old chestnut, the, my all-time favourite science fiction story, um, um, the movie that came out in 1968, 2001, A Space Odyssey. Yeah. Um, I remember after I'd watched that, thinking that all of that was entirely possible. Um, you know, the, the idea of uh, by 2001 we'd be uh, having regular flights to the moon, uh, we'd have artificial gravity space stations, we'd be able to send a spacecraft out to Jupiter to investigate things that were going on. Um, I can't remember which way around it was. It was Saturn, one of the, either Saturn and Jupiter. I think it was one in one in the movie and one in the book, and I can't remember which way around it went. But, but all of that seemed absolutely possible back in yeah. the 1960s. Uh, and even the, uh, you know, the space warp, uh, the, the, the sort of warped space in, um, interdimensional uh, dive at the end of it, uh, likewise seemed like an absolute possibility. So it certainly stirred the bosom of my uh, science fiction heart at that time uh, I was a young scientist just starting out on my career mm, I watched the TV series The Expanse I've watched it twice actually uh, and it too uh, is sort of looking at humanity living across the entire solar system from from the um, um, from Mars Earth and Mars right out through uh, past the gas giants into mm-hmm. uh, deep uh, the deep reaches of the solar system and, and how it's sort of factionalised. So you had Earth and Mars at loggerheads uh, and the people who lived in the outer belt, uh, they called them belters, strangely enough, uh, <laughs> and and they all, the, the, the tensions that existed between them. I see that as feasible. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But within the within the story, 
there were um, technologies that that might exist today, but not to that level. For example, they didn't overcome the problem of zero gravity in space travel. Um, so there wasn't artificial gravity, and we still don't have that today, but they overcame movement around spaceships by having magnetic boots. Yes. Which, you know, seems so very logical. And you yep. can turn them on and off as you needed to, electromagnets in the bot bottoms of the shoes. So you walked around on, on metal decks, um, and, and that's how they solved the problem of no gravity in space. It's, it's, it was a remarkable series and very, very cleverly done. And it sort of showed human nature to a certain degree because we all hated each other and wanted to kill each other yep. <laughs> because we had different beliefs and different different needs and uh, the people in the outer reaches uh, of the belters felt that they were they were slaves to Earth and Mars and they hated us all and it was really cleverly done. But that's the point we're making with this story is that these, these uh, science fiction stories come so very close to being real to the point where they can inspire future scientists and they can inspire future invention um, who knows what the next big idea will be that will come, become a reality as a result of science fiction and, and who knows who the next big scientist will be because they are fans of science fiction. It's, it is a really great uh, and refreshing story. It's, I'm glad somebody did some work on, on, on looking at that link. It's brilliant. Ah. <sighs> Have we covered it enough? I, I think so. I got, I got very excited. I got very yes, excited. I can, over tell, that one. I can tell. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Now, it's a great story. And if you would like to read up on that one, I think that's uh, in Universe Today as well, universetoday.com. Um, yeah, the new study examining the links between science fiction and, uh, and, and astronomy. So um, check it out. It is a great read. Uh, and uh, don't forget to check out our website too if you've um, got a few moments, uh, spacenutspodcast.com, spacenuts.io. If you follow us on social media, don't forget to like us or follow us or add us to your favourites list, especially if you're on YouTube. Uh, please hit the subscribe button. Fred, we are done and dusted for another day. Thank you, sir. Oh, it's a pleasure. What a great set of stories we've had today. It's all good fun. Yeah, they were fun. Yep. So a lot of fun. Um, let's do it again sometime. <laughs> All right. Let's. We'll talk yeah, to you let's. soon. Thanks, Fred. Yeah, no worries. And thanks to Hugh in the studio, uh, pushing all the buttons, pulling all the levers and flushing all the toilets. Uh, thank you, Hugh. And from me, Andrew Dunkley, thanks for your company. Looking forward to joining you again on the very next episode of Space Nuts. Bye-bye. Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favourite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.